you all for coming tonight. I'm Mrs. Freeland. I supervise the Gifted and Talented program. I want to thank you for um, allowing us to work with your students here in G&T. We're very excited about tonight's production. Some of these students have been with us in creative writing and theater arts since third grade, and I'm sure you'll all see um, how they've grown over the years. Um, I want to say thank you to our Board of Education and our Central Administration for supporting the arts and supporting Gifted and Talented and making this presentation possible tonight. Thank you also parents um, for the time that, that you've put in and for lending us your children and such a great job you've done. They're a pleasure to work with. Um, I also want to say thank you to Ms. Quinn and maybe she'll stick her arm out here. Um, for all of the hard work to bring this all together. These students are in eight different classes at five different middle schools, so to bring it all together to one cohesive show um, is quite a feat, but Ms. Quinn does an amazing job every year. Um, thank you to our parents for help with costuming, and thank you to our students for all of your hard work and learning your scripts and your costumes and all of that. So without further Further ado, we're going to start our show, and tonight I will see you again in just a bit. Thank you. Why are we here? Why are there, se why are there seasons? How were the heavens created? For thousands of years, humans have pondered these questions. In order to make sense of the world, the people of ancient Greece shared stories called myths about the gods, goddesses, and heroes in which they believed. These exciting tales explain natural phenomena that could not be explained by science in the ancient world. They also attempted to explore more difficult concepts such as love and hate, joy and sorrow, life and death. The gods and goddesses who controlled everything that happened on Earth lived high above the clouds on Mount Olympus, the highest mountain in Greece. Tonight, you will meet several of those gods and goddesses. Each god or goddess was worshipped as a deity and ruled over certain areas of the Greeks' lives. They believed that these deities possessed amazing strength and special powers, along with immorta immortality. And yet, these gods had very human qualities too. Yes, we felt anger. And jealousy. Greed. And love. Some of us spent a lot of time meddling in the business of mortals on Earth. Some of us were kind and helpful to man. Others were impatient and irritated by man. But we all loved a hero, and there were several brave young mortal men that completed epic quests, fought bravely in wars, and battled against hideous creatures. Greetings, I am Hermes, and I am the messenger of the gods. What's that? You don't know who I am? Well, that isn't surprising. It's been a long time since the Greeks ruled the world. Hermes, if they don't know who we are, we need to start at the beginning. It would be logical to explain who the Greeks were. Of course, Athena. About 2,500 years ago, the Greeks were a very powerful civilization. They controlled most of the known world. The Greeks were polytheistic. That means they believed in more than one god. The biggest and best of those gods were known as the Olympians. There are 12 Olympian gods. The most powerful of the gods are the big three, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. I am Zeus. I am the king of the gods, as well as lord over the sky. I am Poseidon, second to Zeus in power among the gods. I am the god of the sea. I am Hades, the brother of Zeus and Poseidon. I am the god of the underworld and ruler of the dead. I am also the, the god of wealth due to all the gems and precious metals found in my kingdom under the ground. I am Athena, daughter of Zeus. I am the goddess of wisdom, military strategy, and weaving. I am Aphrodite. I am the goddess of love and beauty. My weapon is the thunderbolt, which I hurl at those who displease or defy me. My weapon is the three-pronged spear, called the trident. When I strike the earth with my trident, I cause tremendous earthquakes. And I possess the helm of darkness, a special helmet that allows me to become invisible, even to supernatural beings. I am the companion of heroes during battles, giving them strength and courage to fight. I cause people to fall in love and to appreciate beauty. Anyone who runs around thinking only of love and beauty doesn't really think much at all. You always say something like, oh, look at me, I'm so beautiful, and should be in love with me. Who talks or thinks like that? You're just jealous. Love makes fools of everyone. Just look at all the things people have done in the name of love. That's enough. 
As you can see, the gods and goddesses do not always get along. May I continue? Go on, Hermes. So now you've met the big three, and you've met Athena and Aphrodite. Let's go through the other Olympians, alphabetically. There's Apollo, the god of light and music, and then there's Ares, the god of war. He's one of my favorites. Just look at other business here he sends my way. By that, Hades, you mean Ares and all those wars kill a lot of people. Most would say that wasn't a good thing. Well, I am not most people. Next comes Artemis, goddess of the hunt and protector of young women. Then we have Demeter, goddess of grain and harvest, and Dionysus, god of wine. After them, we move on to the H's, and there are a lot of gods that start with H. You've already met Hades and Hermes. There's also Hephaestus, the god of forging fire. I think he's just wonderful. Wait, what? Didn't you just make fun of Aphrodite for being shallow? Yeah, now you're mooning over Hephaestus. Uh-huh, love isn't all that trivial now, is it? Athena, do you even know if he's got any brains at all? Listen, I'm the goddess of wisdom. Of course he's got brains. He built all those fabulous inventions and figured things out. Keep going, Hermes. You're an Hephaestus. Who's next? Well, there's Hestia, the goddess of home. And then there's... Well... What's got you so worried, Hermes? Afraid of saying her name? Well, if you can't say it, I will. Next is Hera. She's Zeus's wife and queen of the gods. Is she here? Where? Of course, my husband. I was simply staying in the background a bit, just checking to see if any of your girlfriends are around. Girlfriends? My dear, you must be mistaken. I don't think so. Everyone knows all about your wandering eye. How dare you speak to me this way? Where are my lightning bolts? Calm down, Zeus. People will think you don't like each other. Ha, they don't. That's not true. We care for each other, don't we? Well, we can get along at times, but I am very jealous and I never forget any wrong done to me. That's for sure. Look, everyone has heard the stories about you, Zeus. Let's just leave it for now, okay? Hades, stop laughing. Hermes, move on. We are done. Those are all of the Olympians. However, stories about us are filled with many minor deities as well. Yes, there are over 300 other deities representing such things as fortune, poverty, sleep, and dreams. Youth and old age. Mercy and compassion. Sadness and grief. Dusk, dawn, and rainbows. The moon and the winds. The list goes on and on. But the 12 Olympians are the main deities. Never forget that. Certainly not, Zeus. There she goes again. I'd be careful if I were you, Aphrodite. Ladies, ladies, how about we discuss a few of the mythical creatures associated with us? Very well. There is Cerberus, the three-headed dog who guards the entrance to my underground kingdom. And the Gorgon sisters, those hideous monsters with hissing snakes atop their heads instead of hair. Especially that awful Medusa. Don't forget Pegasus, the winged horse I created. Yes, our stories are filled with magic and adventure, heroes and quests, mystery and suspense, and love. Don't forget about love. Even though we are not worshipped as we once were, references to us can be found throughout history. And our influence is still felt today. In science and medicine. In literature and language. In art and sculpture. In music and poetry. And most importantly, in our myths. Step back with us tonight to a time when we truly did rule the earth. And enjoy our mighty tales, which are as mortal as we are. The Judgment of Paris. The Judgment of Paris explores the idea of beauty. The interesting thing is, this myth doesn't really celebrate beauty as particularly positive, but instead shows us that beauty can cause major problems. Some might say the Judgment of Paris was the first beauty contest in history, more precisely in mythology. Unfortunately, the outcome of this contest was terrible, nothing less than the Trojan War. Please join us for the Judgment of Paris. On the great mountain of Olympus, nothing was more exciting than a wedding. Everyone had gathered for the union between Thetis, a sea nymph, and Peleus, a mortal. Everyone except Eris, who had not been invited. Eris was the goddess of discord, and she loved nothing more than to cause trouble. True to her nature, she snuck into the wedding hall. Eris pulled forth from her pocket a golden apple, engraved upon it with the words, For the fairest, ha ha ha, they should get them going. Careful not to draw attention to herself, she placed the apple among the gifts for the newly wedded couple. 
It didn't take long for Aphrodite to notice it there. What a marvelous apple, and look, it's engraved, for the fairest, someone has obviously placed this here for me. How can you be so sure? Well, it's obviously not here for you. Why wouldn't it be? Beauty is not commonly associated with manliness. Who do you think you're talking to? Ladies, ladies, I have a simple solution to your problem. I am the queen of heaven, so therefore the apple would naturally be for me. Oh please, this is foolishness. This apple is mine. Kindly unhand that apple. You're tarnishing it. I most certainly will not. Since it was going to be no easy discussion, and the guests had already started to feel a little bit awkward, the wedding disbanded. The wedding couple left, their day ruined. Eris laughed to herself. My plan is working perfectly. Ha ha ha. The three goddesses went to Zeus and begged him to decide who would receive the apple. Zeus became angry over all the fighting and refused to give the apple to any of them. The goddesses demanded that Zeus find someone to judge which of them deserved the apple. Zeus looked down upon the earth. Where would he find such a suitable judge? Zeus chose a young man named Paris who lived in the kingdom of Troy. Zeus warned the goddesses to be careful and to not let any harm come to the land of Troy. The three goddesses descended to earth where they found Paris. Mortal prince, do not fear. We are goddesses from Olympus. Come with a task for your noble mind. Paris was terrified, but he knew he must obey the goddesses. I will do whatever you wish. We have been having a bit of a disagreement. We wish you to settle it. Me? Judge between us. We will each present ourselves in our best light. And you, Paris, will decide once and for all who is the fairest between us. I shall try. Paris waited for his next order. I am the queen of heaven. I shall go first. Hera was stunning. She drew forward to Paris and leaned in. She smelled of the finest perfume. Young prince, choose me in this contest and I will make it worth your while. I will make you a lord of all of Europe and Asia. I will give you power beyond your wildest dreams. Choose me if you are wise. Excuse me, what are you saying over there? You have had enough time. I am finished. Hera backed away from Paris. Now it is my turn. Athena approached Paris. Her beauty shone forth. She smelled of grassy meadows, fresh and breathtaking. Brave prince, choose me in this contest. Many, many countries envy the treasures of Troy. What can prevent these countries from invading you? I will offer you victory in battle. Think of your family. I am the goddess of war. It is in my power. Glory comes to the victorious warrior. What lies are you telling the boy? Your time is up. It is my turn now. I am finished. She retreated. Her lips parted in a celestial smile. Aphrodite approached next. Her face was the most glorious thing Paris had ever seen. Truly, she was the goddess of love. Don't be fooled by the others. I can see what you truly want. What else would any young, handsome man such as you want? Love, it's what I do. Gorgeous prince, if you choose me, I shall give you the hand of the most beautiful woman in the world. Paris's heart stopped. His desire did not rest with glory or power, but with love. Aphrodite felt this, and she smiled smartly as she walked away. I hope you didn't promise anything you can't deliver. On the contrary. Forgetting that he was in the presence of immortality, Paris interrupted the goddesses. I have made my decision. Remember, we are powerful. To offend us would have great consequences. But it did not matter to the Trojan prince. He found the desire of his heart. I choose Aphrodite, goddess of love. Fool! I knew you were worthless. I will remember this when you call upon my name. May your kingdom crumble. With that, Athena left in a huff. How dare you treat the queen of heaven this way? Whatever future you have, I will do all in my power to make it a sad one. Hera, too, was gone in a blink of an eye. Only Aphrodite was left, holding a golden apple, a smile of triumph on her face. You have made a wise choice, Paris of Troy. I will bestow my reward on you. Prepare yourself. I will momentarily tell you how to how, momentarily tell you how to claim your prize. Thank you. Thank you. Aphrodite went back to Mount Olympus to announce her victory to Zeus. She bragged that she had promised Paris that he could marry the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. Zeus explained that Helen was already married to the king of Sparta, but Aphrodite insisted. Back on Earth, Paris sailed to Sparta and convinced Helen to leave her undesirable husband and come live with him in Troy. On Olympus, Athena and Hera confronted Aphrodite. Fool! Don't you know what you've started? All's fair in love and war. Exactly! Once Paris returns to Troy with Helen, his father, King Priam, will have no choice but to protect his son. I can protect his son. Can you? We shall see about that. 
You and your foolish ways have angered me against these Trojans. I will send all of Greece after your two lovers. As will I. It is not right what you have done. You two don't frighten me. Paris is brave and handsome. He will fight for Helen. He will die for her, and I will laugh as the crows pick his bones. Are you so sure? All of Olympus will soon be in an uproar. This time you have gone too far. We'll, we'll just see about that. What do you think, Athena? Will Aphrodite be remembered as the fairest of them all, or the destroyer of many? The goddess of death, I say. Let the battle begin then. I am ready. And so the chain of events was set into motion. The greatest war of man was about to begin. The face that would launch a thousand ships had been taken. The fairest city ever built would soon be under attack, and thousands would die. And to think, this all started because of a simple apple. Echo and Narcissus. The Greeks used myths to explore human emotions and experiences, as well as to explain natural phenomena. The next myth serves as a warning against vanity and arrogance. It also explains the origin of echoes and why a particularly beautiful white flower can often be found near woodland ponds. Join us in a, lo in, in a long ago forest for the myth of Echo and Narcissus. On Mount Olympus, the home of the gods, Zeus and Hera were having a very heated conversation about one of their forest nymphs. These beings weren't nearly as powerful as gods, but had more power than the average human. I just can't stand it anymore. Something's gotta be done. Well, have you tried talking to her about it? Talk to her. That's the whole problem. I can't even get a word in edgewise when she's around. She doesn't give me a chance to talk to myself. Would you like me to have a word with her? It won't work. I've tried everything. I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my temper, and you know what that means. Don't even think about using one of my thunderbolts. We've got to settle this peacefully. You've got to negotiate with her. They were talking about Echo, a forest imp who was supposed to serve Hera. Listen, did you hear who was turned into a tree? Well, the water spirits told me all about it. Do you know the babbling brook? She knows everything, almost as much as Zeus himself. I hope Zeus doesn't mind me saying that. I mean, he does know everything. Where was I? Oh, yes being turned into a tree, and not any ordinary tree. She, talk, she talked to Hecko about everything and everyone, the other nymphs, the gods, the silly things that mortal did or they didn't do, everything. Hera tried to be polite at first. Then her neck started getting tired from nodding so much. She found herself wasting valuable time just listening to Echo. Hera tried talking to Echo. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh Echo, if I could interrupt, excuse me. My queen, did you want to say something? Well, it's about your talking, you know. You do go on sometimes. Do I? I guess I do. You know, my mother always said the same thing to me. Echo my daughter how you do go on, she'd say. But she could talk herself. Let me tell you, once when I was just a tiny nymph. This is hopeless. Hera put up with the long-winded chatter for a long time, but one day her patience ran out. Where's my husband? Where's Zeus? There's an emergency about to happen. I can't find him anywhere. Has anybody seen him? I've seen him. I was afraid of that. Back on Earth, Echo had seen Zeus flirting with some of her fellow nymphs. She knew she couldn't let Hera know that. So she kept chattering away with Hera to give Zeus time to return to Olympus. Zeus was just here a minute ago. You know, everybody has to take a break and relax now and then, even if Zeus is supposed to be on duty at all times. You know... Just tell me where. I had a cousin who was so serious all the time that he made himself sick. Let me tell you. Enough. I can't take it anymore. Silence. Why, Queen, I didn't know. I must put a stop to your babbling. Hera raised her hand and made this decree. From now on, your talus tongue will rest. For all of us, even this will be the best. For words you never had a laugh, but now you only have the power to speak back. Speak back. That's my royal decree. Do you understand? Understand. From that minute forward, Echo had only the power to repeat the last words that others said. And she was bound to do so for the rest of time. As you can imagine, Echo felt terrible. All of her feelings were bottled up inside her. When she wasn't serving Echo, wait, when she wasn't serving Hera, Echo began to wander alone in the woods. One day she saw a handsome young man taking a hike. Echo's mood lifted immediately. This young man happened to be Narcissus. 
It's a shame that the world is just so full of, how can I put it kindly, average people. It's just impossible to find anyone who comes even close to my standards. Narcissus had been told by so many people that he was so good looking he was only interested in one person, himself. When Echo saw him, she fell hopelessly in love. She followed closely behind him as he wandered in the woods. But she was careful not to reveal herself. Of course, she wanted to say something to the young man, but she had to wait for him to speak first. Suddenly, Narcissus thought he had, some, he had heard someone moving in the bushes. Who's there? Who's there? Come out. Come out. Oh, so you're playing a joke on me. Well, I won't have it. Show yourself this instant. Echo stepped out from behind the bush. This instant. Silly girl, I suppose you are so awestruck by my handsomeness that you have lost the ability to speak properly. Surely you love me. Love me? Love you? Never. No one is good enough for me. How dare you love me? Love me. Oh, please, just leave me alone. Alone. With that, Narcissus strode away, leaving Echo all alone. <laughs> Narcissus walked through the forest talking to himself. Imagine that girl thinking I could love her. Ha! Ah, she's just like all the rest. Oh well, who can blame them? Suddenly, Narcissus found himself in front of a lovely pond. I think I'll have a drink. Narcissus leaned over to drink from the pond. Well, 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 what do we have here? As Narcissus bent over, he saw a beautiful image in the crystal clear water. He became mesmerized by his own reflection. Narcissus sat next to the pond, gazing at himself. And that's just how the young man spent the rest of his short life sitting by the pond in love with his own reflection. In the spot where the young man spent his last days, there grew a beautiful flower that now bears his name. Echo never stopped loving the handsome Narcissus. Upon his death, she fled to a cave and spent the rest of her days mourning Narcissus. And to this day, you can hear Echo's voice in all caves all around the world. In the myth of King Midas, we meet a greedy king who was given the power to turn everything he touches into gold. Although this may sound like a dream come true, it was anything but. In this meet, we also meet Dionysus, a god known for his carefree and happy nature. He enjoyed parties and always offered his help to anyone in need. This tale reminds us that having one's wishes come true may not always be a positive experience and may even hold serious consequences. Travel with us to an ancient Greek kingdom and discover how King Midas gained the golden touch. Long ago there lived a very wealthy king. His name was Midas. King Midas spent every day in an enormous room that overflowed with treasure. There were piles of glittering diamonds, stacks of twinkling sapphires, and mountains of gold coins. King Midas was the richest man in all the land, and loved nothing more than to count all of his gold coins. But he wanted more, always more. A young woman came into the treasure room. It was Midas' daughter, Marigold, named for a golden flower. Marigold, come my dear, I have bought you some gold jewelry for your hair and wrists. You must display your riches. Oh father, I do love you and I thank you for these gifts, but I am not happy wearing them. What? I do not understand you, Marigold. I love to feel the cool wind in my hair and I think roses make much better jewelry. Please father, come explore with me and smell the beautiful flowers. Oh no, I do not care for flowers. But father, we could go for a walk in the woods and you could hear the birds singing. <laughs> Marigold, go and play. I must stay here and count my treasure. The king went back to counting his treasures. Later, Midas was disturbed by his advisor, who informed the king that he had a visitor. An old man approached the king. It was Selenus, the woodland god and close friend of Dionysus. Selenus explained that he had become separated from Dionysus during a hunt. He had come to the palace to ask King Midas for help. Midas offered to send scouts to find Dionysus. In the meantime, he honored Selenus with a great feast. The next day, Midas received word that Dionysus had been found and brought to the palace. King Midas, you show great kindness to Selenus. As a reward, I am to grant you a wish. A wish? You may have any wish you desire, but I urge you to choose wisely. Gold is what I cherish most. More gold? But you are already the richest king in all of Greece. I urge you to choose something else. Gold brings me happiness. And what could be better than more happiness? Midas thought for a moment. My heart's desire is that everything I touch will turn to gold. What a terrible wish. Please choose something else. I cannot, for that is my heart's desire. And what will you do with all your gold? I will treasure it, of course. You humans. Very well, if that is your wish, I will grant it for you. 
You now have the golden touch. Anything you now touch will turn to gold. Yes, my wish is granted. Can he really mean it? King Midas looked down and noticed. The sleeve on my robe, it's turning gold. And my sandals, and my crown. Everything I am wearing is pure gold. He was so elated that he reached out to touch a curtain as he walked past. It too turned to a rigid golden metal. Just then, his daughter Marigold entered the room. Hello, Father. Where did you get that stiff robe? It does not even move. It is gold. The gods have given me the golden touch. The golden touch? Yes, my dear. Now we may have anything in the world that we want. King Midas sat down to dinner in his large chair. Father, your chair. The chair turned to gold, and so did the napkin King Midas had attempted to slide onto his lap. He was beaming with joy. The moment the king touched his plate, it turned to gold. I shall, I shall turn all the chairs and plates in the palace to gold. King Midas took his spoon and raised a spoonful of the delicious soup into his mouth. He tasted it, and it was very good. But as he tried to swallow, the taste turned cold. And there was simply a lump of golden metal <coughs> in his mouth. What is this? Is there a stone in my soup? How could this be? He reached for an apple, and it too turned to gold. Then he reached for grapes, bread, and his drink, all gold. No, not my food. I do not want my food to be gold. Midas was terribly upset and called out to the gods for help. This made Marigold want to come for her father. She gently placed her hand on his arm. Father, what has happened? Will you never eat again? Before she could say anything else, her cheeks became cold and her skin turned golden. The king drew away in fear and looked at his daughter. She turned into a hard golden statue. Great Dionysus, my wish has turned into a curse. Please return my daughter to me. Dionysus took pity on King Midas and appeared before him. I have heard you, Midas. I warned you to choose your wish wisely. Do you still care so much about your gold? No, no. All the gold in the world is not as precious as my daughter. Please give me back my little girl. Will you leave your treasure room to take in the beauties of the world? Will you walk in the woods with Marigold and open your heart to the love and gifts of nature? I will. Yes, I will. Then take this pitcher of sacred water. Pour the water over everything that's turned to gold, and it will be undone. Thank you, kind God. You are welcome. But might us always remember, there are things more valuable than gold. As soon as the sacred water touched Marigold's skin, she was restored to her former self. Father, I had the strangest dream. I dreamt that I could not speak or move or... My dear daughter, never mind that. It is all no over now. Let us have a great feast, and when we are finished, Will you take me on a walk to see the flowers? Oh, Father, I would love to. That would be wonderful. And they did just that. They walked together every morning, afternoon, and evening. On these walks, King Midas found more happiness than he ever thought possible. For the king had learned that love is what makes a person rich, not gold. People have been struggling with the question of how evil and suffering first entered the world since the beginning of time. The myth of Pandora's box is one of the most famous legends in the world and has been fascinating people for thousands of years. Learn how evil entered the world as we open Pandora's box. Long ago, according to the ancient Greeks, man lived a life free of pain and sorrow. There was no greed, no war, and no suffering. And above all, there was no sickness, nor was there death. That is, until Prometheus gave man the gift of fire. Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus were two titans who had fought on the side of the Olympian gods in the great war between the titans and the Olympians. After the battle, Zeus called Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus. Epimetheus, Prometheus and Epimetheus, I have a task for you. What do you need, Zeus? I want you to go down to Earth and create new men and new beasts. How will we do that? When you arrive on Earth, simply go to the river. Use the clay on the banks to create the mortals, both human and animal. You will find it works well. Yes, Zeus. As you work, you can give each creature gifts to make it swift, strong, or whatever traits you see fit to bestow. We will do as you ask. The brothers journeyed to Earth and began to create many creatures. Prometheus took great care, crafting each man in the image of the gods. Epimetheus created the animals. They could run fast, see far, and hear from great distances. They also had warm co coats of fur, while the men were left to shiver in the cold. Taking pity on his creations, Promethe Prometheus went to Zeus for help. Zeus, my people are cleverly crafted, but they need warmth and a way to prepare their food. Won't you share the sacred fire with them? Fire is very special. It is just for the gods, not for mere mortals. Get back to work. Prometheus returned to Earth, but he couldn't stop thinking about the fire. He felt responsible for the creatures he created. You are clearly troubled, dear brother. What is the matter? 
I've been observing the humans, and I feel so sorry for them. They have to suffer in this coldness. Suddenly, an idea came to Prometheus. I know what I could do to help them. I know what you are thinking, and it is not a good idea. Please, let me give them fire. They will be able to warm their food and cook their... Warm their bodies and cook their food. That Zeus has forbidden us to give the humans fire, Prometheus. I know, but... The humans will not be able to control themselves, and they will use fire to destroy. No, I'm sure it will be fine. I'm sure they wouldn't do that. Prometheus snuck up to Olympus. He stole an ember from the fire there and gave it to man, warning them to never let it die out. The fire kept the humans warm. Before long, the humans learned how to hunt the beasts and cook their meat. The smell of roasting meat drifted to the heavens, alerting Zeus to Prometheus's betrayal. He summoned Prometheus to Olympus. You have disobeyed me, Prometheus. Don't you know that fire is only for the gods? I know, Zeus, but... Why did you dare give it to the humans? I only wanted to help them keep warm and cook their food. Look what they are doing, Prometheus. They are dying, but not from the cold. Fire has become a weapon for them. Yeah. Do you realize your mistake? Yes. I'm sorry. You were just sorry? You need me more than that. But Zeus, you gave Earth and its creatures into our care. Nevertheless, you have overstepped your boundaries. Prometheus, you have tricked me for the last time. Zeus banished Prometheus to the underworld, where he would be punished night and day. Zeus was so angry, he decided to punish the humans on Earth as well. Until this time, all mortals were men. Zeus decided it was time they had a woman. He called Hephaestus, god of the forge, to him. Zeus ordered him to create a new mortal, fashioned after a goddess rather than a god. Once Hephaestus was done, Zeus called upon the gods to bestow gifts upon his creation. Aphrodite gave her the gifts of beauty and charm. Athena gave her the gifts of weaving and spinning. And Apollo gave her the gift of music. I shall call her Pandora, which means she of many gifts. Zeus called Epimetheus to his throne in Olympus. How can I serve you, Zeus? Actually, I have a great gift for you. The gods and goddesses have fashioned a woman to be your helpmate on Earth. Her name is Pandora. Thank you, great Zeus. As a wedding gift, please accept this golden box. He handed Pandora a box that shimmered with a mysterious energy. Thank you, oh Zeus. It is beautiful. Yes, its contents are quite extraordinary. They are so costly that, in fact, you must never open it. Never? Never. I am trusting you to keep this rare treasure safe. We will. Remember, you must never open it. Oh, no, Zeus, we won't. We will obey you. What no one realized was that Zeus had also given Pandora a gift. A gift he had kept secret, the gift of curiosity. Later, Epimetheus and Pandora took the box home and placed it on a high shelf. Epimetheus was very happy with his bride. But all P Pandora could think about was the golden box. What do you think is inside? Zeus said it was extraordinary. Is it gold, jewels, something magical? Pandora, it must remain a mystery. As the days went by, Pandora couldn't stop thinking about the box. This is maddening. Day after day, the box calls to me. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Do you have any idea how hard that is? Zeus told us never to open it, and so we shall not. Aren't you dying of curiosity? I am not in the habit of disobeying the king of the gods. Surely a little peek wouldn't hurt anything. Turn your attention elsewhere, Pandora. One day, when Epimetheus was out, Pandora took the box off the shelf. Holding it to her ear, she shook it gently. She heard fluttering and the whisper of voices. One voice seemed to be begging for help. <gasps> Who is in there? Another voice asked her to imagine the treasures inside the box. I must know what's inside, but Zeus said it was forbidden to look. Yet another voice taunted her, saying, Aren't you curious, Pandora? Yes! Another voice whispered, Go ahead, Pandora. I suppose it cannot hurt to open it, just a little. Pandora clutched the box in her hands. No one will know if I just take a peek. Pandora released a golden latch. She cracked the lid ever so slightly. A hissing sound and foul smell emerged as the lid flew open. The box did not contain treasure at all. Out of the box flew every evil thing that had ever been created. Ah! We're free! At last! Who, who are you? 
I am deception. Mankind will now have two faces, one false and one true. Humans will use every type of trickery to cheat and swindle, mislead and delude. They will trap each other in webs of false compliments and phony promises. My followers will strike down those who trust them with vicious lies and acts of betrayal. I will give them scheming, lying hearts. They will hide behind masks of friendship while speaking vile words behind each other's backs. I will turn mankind's trust into dust. I am beautifully dangerous. I am deception. I am greed. Now mortals will have an insatiable hunger to possess more than they need. Whether man's all-consuming desire is for wealth, power, fame, or riches, I will be there, thriving within every self-centered thought. I will cause the human to devour me to have to that I will cause the I will cause the humans to devour anyone or anything that stands in the way of their selfish desires. I will teach them that lying, cheating, and stealing are perfectly acceptable ways to obtain what they wish. But I have a secret. I will cause the mortals who follow me to have a bottomless pit in their hearts, which will never be filled, no matter how much they possess. I am endless hunger. I am greed. I am disease. Now mankind will be tormented by afflictions that will flow through their bodies like waves. Plagues will paralyze nations. Viruses, infections, and fevers will attack humans without warning. As they weaken and waste away, the mortals will search desperately for cures. But I'm a mystery cloaked in pain. Not even man's best healers, charms, and potions will be able to stop me from destroying their weak, pathetic bodies. I will not be satisfied until I have completely overpowered each and every mortal. I am relentless. I am disease. I am anger. I am an uncontrollable fire consuming all in my path. I will cause humans to make impulsive decisions and commit reckless acts of rage. Harsh, hurtful words will flow from their mouths like lava, searing the souls of those who hear them. The fists of my followers will hold ferocious fury. I will cause humans to become single-minded and blind. I will control them completely. I am savage. I am anger. I am fear. I feast on cold sweats, white knuckles, and shaking limbs. I will worm my way into the mortals' thoughts and fill their minds with anxiety and dread. My icy fingers will wrap around their trembling hearts and suck the courage out of their souls. Man will sense danger at every turn, even where none exists. My followers will be filled with phobias. Deep down, they will long to flee and hide from me, but I will be lurking around every dark corner, creeping up every creaky staircase, turning every groaning doorknob. I am the terror of a thousand nightmares. I am fear. Oh, how I wish for your curiosity, dear Pandora. I am envy. Now mankind will be consumed with an unquenchable thirst for what others possess. Women will despise their sisters for their beauty, charm, and jewels. Men will hate their brothers for their power, lands, and wealth. Every waking hour will be filled with misery as the mortals dwell on what others have, resulting in depression and frustration. Those who follow me will never be satisfied. I will be that nagging voice in their hearts, keeping them from feeling fulfilled. I am envy. I am war. Now humans will battle against each other. I will bring chaos and destruction to lands near and far, giving mankind an unquenchable thirst for power and bloodshed. I will ignite the flames of hostility in the humans' hearts. Violence will spread like plagues. Families will be torn apart and nations will be destroyed. Tyrants and dictators will rise up and lead with aggression and brutality, crushing, invading, and defeating without mercy. I am the bringer of chaos. I am war. I am hate. Man will now despise and scorn each other. Humanity will become evil and vile, making hasty, irreversible decisions that they will regret forever. People will look into the eyes of their neighbors with cruelty blazing in their soul. My gifts to the mortals will be prejudice and intolerant, hostility and spite. I will cause man to plot the downfall of others, to hold grudges and to seek vengeance. I start off as a small spark, but grow into a raging inferno. I am brutal. I am hate. Oh no, what have I done? Pandora slammed the lid shut, but it was too late. Epimetheus heard Pandora's screams and came running in. He gasped in horror as the creatures flew out of the window, leaving behind a trail of black smoke. What have you done? I opened the box and all of the evils of the world have escaped. How could you? Zeus asked you to do one simple thing and you failed. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to. Your apology is useless. These evils can never be contained. Suddenly, a golden light shone through the throat's cracks. 
Something is still inside. I can feel the warmth of its glow. Pandora hesitantly opened the box again. Out flew a beautiful golden being. You have played out Zeus's punishment to man. Punishment? Yes for accepting the gift of fire from Prometheus. These evils will go among mankind and cause much suffering. You are not like the others. Who are you? I am Hope. Hope? All is not lost, Pandora. Even though your curiosity has released terrible troubles into the world, the humans will always have me. What can you do? I will comfort mankind and help them pain and help them bear the pains of the evils you have unleashed. But thank heaven you are here. I will give mankind the courage and strength needed to endure any troubles they face. No matter how bad things get, I will help people believe that things will get better. You are kind and good, indeed. I am more powerful than any of the miseries. For with hope, there is power, and all things are possible. And so hope went out among the mortals. Her gift available to those who, those with faith. In the power of good to triumph over evil. The ancient Greeks believed in a strong association between the land and the divine, and the cities in Greece usually featured a patron deity. Sometimes there were even myths that explained how a specific god or goddess came to be connected with an area. One such example is the tale of the contest for the city of Athens, the largest city in Greece. Join us as we tell how Athens acquired its patron deity. A long, long time ago, there was a prosperous city that had an extraordinary queen. Her name was Queen Cacrops, and she was part human and part snake. She was also very proud of her city. The city is growing stronger every day. We are all working together and have so much to be proud of. The queen always obeyed the gods and knew that the success of her city had as much to do with their gifts as the talents of the people. She wanted to find a patron deity to stand for her city. There are actually two deities already fighting for this title. Upon hearing the desire of Queen Kacross to make it official, they became even more competitive. I am Athena, goddess of courage and wisdom. I will be a perfect saint for your city. I can see your success and would be honored to stand for you all. I am Poseidon, one of the 12 great gods who sat at the table of Olympus. And I also control the seas. I would be the perfect deity to stand for your city. Athena and Poseidon began to have daily arguments over who would be the best choice. Finally, Queen K. Crops called them both together and pleaded for them to stop their fighting. I call upon Athena, goddess of courage and wisdom, and Poseidon, god of the sea. Please stop this bickering. Since you both want to be patron of our city, how do we decide who shall be named? Surely it would be me, as I would be the best representation of the people with my great powers and command of the sea. Oh, surely it will be me, as I would be the best representation of the people with my wisdom. I would bring courage to your people and protect you always. You are mad to think that you would be a better protector than I. Huh. What? Don't be foolish. Clearly with my warrior talents and my keen intelligence, I'm the obvious choice. Then we will fight to the end. We will. I'm not afraid of you. And these two deities did almost start a war over this shared desire. But just as they were about to attack each other. Queen K. Crops pleaded with them once again. Please, we are so blessed that you both want to honor us with our gifts, but we cannot have a war. I beg you, do not let war be the answer. Athena, in her wisdom, heard his pleas and thought for a moment. Then she came up with an idea. We shall hold a contest. The winner will be named patron of the city and this feud will be over. Queen Kaycrop shall be the judge and make the final decision. I'm listening. Tell me more. The contest will show which one of us can give the best gifts to the people of the city. We both carry strong powers and abilities. Let's see which one of us can deliver the best and most prosperous gift. Sounds reasonable. The people will decide. Poseidon agreed quite quickly, since he could not imagine anything more powerful than the sea, and felt that there was no way he could lose. I agree to this contest you suggest. The winner, as the grand prize, gets the city and title of patron. I agree as well. This way, the people will prosper too. We thank you both. Very well. We shall have the day to decide and present our gifts this evening. By nightfall, we shall have a winner and a patron for this fine city. The day went on, and peop the people of the city were overwhelmed with wonder. What would the god and goddess bring them? What would they offer? Finally, the time to present the gifts arrived. All the people gathered to see the contest. 
Queen K crop set up high in the Acropolis, waiting for each deity to offer their gift. It is time to begin. Poseidon, god of the sea, you will go first. Please, Poseidon, offer your gift. Thank you, good queen. Poseidon proudly stood before the queen. He lifted his massive trident and hit the ground with it. I give you the gift of the sea. Just then, at the exact place where Poseidon hit his trident, a spring of frothy water erupted and filled part of the land. I know there is no greater resource than water. I give it to you, the people. May it always bless you. The people loved it and rushed to the spring. But when they tasted the water, they were shocked by its salty taste. Since Poseidon was the god of the sea, the only water sources he could control were the salty seas. A powerful gift indeed. Thank you, Poseidon. Now, it's Athena's turn. Thank you. Athena was a lot less dramatic in her presentation. She simply knelt down and put something into the ground. I give you this gift of this olive tree. It'll keep you fed, provide oil for your lamps, and furnish wood for you to build your boats and houses. It will always provide. Suddenly, a huge olive tree came up from the ground and grew over the heads of the people. Its beauty amazed them all. I trust this gift will be well received. Yes, yes, this gift is a tremendous resource for our city. The people gathered around and everyone cheered for Athena's gift. They knew it would offer much more than the salty sea. You have seen both gifts. Which do you choose? The sea is a wonderful resource for our city, but this cheer will benefit us greatly in many ways. It will give us food, wood, and oil for many years. The people nod in agreement. As queen, I choose Athena's gift. Thank you, Queen k -Crops. It is my honor to be patron goddess of your city. Our city is yours, and we shall proclaim our love for you, Athena, by giving this city your name. From now on, the city will be called Athens, and we shall forever be in your debt. Of course, Athena was thrilled to be named the protector of the city. She enjoyed the adoration and gratitude that she received from the people. Athena vowed to care for them, and she did, always. Poseidon was not so happy. He roared with anger and cursed the city in a tantrum of, de of defeat. How dare you choose her instead of me? I cursed the city with water shortages and floods. At that, Poseidon hit his trident once again on the ground and returned to the sea. Athena did always protect the people of Athens as she had promised. In return, the people built a huge statue in her, her honor. And the people would never forget the day their beloved goddess became the patron of Athens. Medusa and Athena. Long ago and far away, there was an island in the middle of the sea. It was not a gentle, peaceful island with swaying green trees and soft breezes. It was a barren pile of windswept rock where wild waves crashed against the shore. On this island lived three terrible monsters called the Grogan sisters. They were part woman and part snake. Listen to the t tale of how one of these monsters came to be. As the patron goddess of Athens, Athena loved to look down on her beloved city and admire its splendor. She was very impressed by the Parthenon, a huge temple that had been built in her honor. There was one person in Athens who stood out among the rest. Although there were many attractive girls in the city, Medusa was considered the loveliest. I am the prettiest of them all. It was the truth. Medusa was truly the most beautiful girl in Greece. Don't you think my hair is glorious? It certainly is. I think, I think it glows brighter than the sun. What do you think? No one has hair like yours, Medusa. It brightens every room and every place I enter. The sun is nothing compared to me. Medusa couldn't stop talking about her beauty. My eyes are greener than the sea. Yes, you have the most stunning eyes I have ever seen. The sea is nothing compared to me. Medusa never got tired of admiring herself. My lips are redder than the reddest rose. They are red indeed. How fortunate are all those who lay their eyes on me. When she wasn't busy sharing her thoughts about her beauty, Medusa would gaze lovingly at her reflection in her hand mirror. I can't help but admire myself. I'm so gorgeous. Has there ever been a reflection such as mine? Medusa went on and on around her beauty to anyone and everyone who stopped long enough to hear her. Until one day when she made her first visit to the Parthenon. Isn't this grand? The Parthenon is the largest temple to the goddess Athena in all the land. It is grand indeed. Yes. Everything is amazing. Look at all these wonderful sculptures and paintings. Everyone who entered the temple was astonished by its magnificence. They were grateful to Athena, goddess of wisdom, for inspiring them and watching over their city. Everyone, that is, except Medusa. 
I would have made a much better subject for the sculptor than Athena. Medusa looked carefully at the paintings of Athena. The artist did a fine job, considering the goddess's thick eyebrows. Medusa imagined how much finer the paintings would be if there was someone as delicate as she was. When she reached the altar, she sighed happily. <sighs> My, this is a beautiful temple. What a shame it's wasted on Athena. I'm so much prettier than she is. Medusa continued to compare herself to Athena. Her friends grew pale and frightened. Perhaps someday, people will build an even grander temple to my beauty. All those who heard Medusa gasped. I can just imagine it. People would come every day and worship me. All the people in the temple quickly began to leave. Except for Medusa, who was busy looking proudly in the large bronze doors of the temple. Suddenly, instead of her own features, it was a face of Athena reflected back at her. Bane and foolish girl, how dare you insult me? Medusa was shocked to see Athena standing before her. You think you're prettier than I am? Well, I doubt it to be true, but even if it were, there is more to life than beauty alone. What else could there be? Everyone wants to be beautiful. There is nothing more important than beauty. While others work and play and learn, you do little but boast and admire yourself. But, Athena, my beauty is an inspiration to those around me. I make their lives better simply by looking so lovely. Athena sounds to her with a frustrated way. Nonsense. Beauty fades swiftly in all mortals. It is not comfort the sick, teach the unskilled, or feed the hungry. <sighs> yes, Athena, but seriously, isn't my beauty just as important as all those things? I have had enough of this. I shall banish you to the farthest corner of the earth, and by my powers, your loveliness shall be stripped away completely. With that, Athena and Medusa disappeared from the temple, and Athena transported them to the ends of the earth. Medusa soon found herself in a dark and gloomy cave. Strange slithering sounds could be heard in its blackness. <laughs> Medusa's face had been changed to that of a hideous monster. Her hair was twisted and thickened into horrible snakes that hissed and fought each other atop her head. Where are we? Somewhere where no one will look upon you again. No! What have you done to me, Athena? Your face is now so terrible to behold that the mere sight of it were to a man to stone. To stone? Even you, Medusa, should you try to look at your own reflection, shall turn the rock the instant you see your face. Oh no, you can't do this. Now, with your hair of snakes, you will live here with these monsters, the Gorgon sisters, so that no innocent shall turn to stone at the sight of you. But why? This has been because of your pride. You have brought this upon yourself, Medusa. And with that, Athena left Medusa and returned to Mount Olympus. Medusa did spend the rest of her days in misery. Never again was she able to look upon her own reflection. And the only companions she had were the Gorgon sisters and the snakes that constantly hissed around her head. Let the fate of Medusa be the warning to all who dare insult the gods. Athena. Athena held a powerful position in the ancient Greek world. Although Athena was wise and could be kind and understanding, she could also get angry and punish those who angered her. In our next myth, we meet Arachne, a very talented spinner and weaver, but also arrogant. So arrogant that she challenged the goddess Athena to a contest. Disco discover what happened when the goddess accepted her challenge as we present the myth of Arachne and Athena. High on a cliff above the Aegean Sea stood a simple clay house, home to Sophia and her granddaughter Arachne. One evening, Athena came to the house wearing a cloak to hide her identity. Athena admired the richly colored fabrics which filled the room. Welcome to our workshop. Athena saw Arachne weaving at a loom. Who is this? This is my granddaughter, Arachne. She loves nothing more than to weave. Athena examined the tapestry Arachne was making. Alas, there has been no one to help her since my, her mother has died, and my fingers are too old and I cannot help her. What are you making, my dear? A picture of Athena. Ah, yes. There's her shield. But what is this? Her purple yarn. It is said that Athena weaves the most beautiful tapestries. If you move your fingers like this, you will be able to capture the curve of Athena's arm better. Like this? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Hmm, my hair is a little longer than that, don't you think? Athena cast back her clothes, revealing her shining hair and beautiful gown. Athena! Both Sophia and Arachne were shocked to see the goddess standing before them. Arachne, you are as gifted as any mortal I have ever seen. Thank you, Athena. 
I would like to nurture your talent. Would you like me to be your teacher? More than anything. So it shall be. A year later, Arachne and her friend Callista were sitting at their looms in the weaving workshop. Callista looked over at Arachne's loom. Those grapes are amazing. They look edible. Athena taught me a lot about color. Yours is nice too, but nowhere as beautiful as yours. Sophia walked in with the merchant. These, these tapestries are the work of the finest weavers in Greece. This one is amazing. I can practically feel the splash of the water. Who wove this? I did. It is a marvel. And this one with the table overflowing with the fruits and flowers? That one's mine also. I will buy both and anything else made by this remarkable young woman. She has clearly been blessed by Athena. The merchant handed a sack of gold coins to Sophia. Arachne beamed with pride. As time passed, Arachne's fame spread. People from far and wide came to see her work. Arachne's weaving really is extraordinary. Remember, my granddaughter was the pupil of Athena for five years. Of course, how else could a person become so skilled? Arachne rolled her eyes. It's not like I had anything to do with it. Callista looked at her friend in surprise. Surely you are not denying what Athena has taught you. I'm just saying that when people look at my tapestries, all they talk about is Athena. I don't think that's true. People are impressed with your work, and they're also impressed that Athena chose you as her student. Are they, though? People act like Athena just happened to choose me, like she might have just as easily chosen you. Calista blinked back her tears. I, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant, I know it's you, what you meant. It's all right, though, but I would be careful if I were you. Careful? The gods do not like it when their gifts aren't appreciated. Several months later, the merchant came back to the workshop. to buy this new tapestry. It is truly beautiful. Arachne, you must be so grateful to Athena. Grateful? Don't you think the reason I'm so good might have to do something with, I don't know, me? I would say so. Only Athena could do better. Enough about Athena already. We must show respect to the gods. Why? It's not like the gods are so perfect. Arachne's voice grew louder. Zeus has handed down some cruel punishments, don't you think? And as for your precious little Athena, she turned some poor woman into a monster with snakes for hair. It is not good for us to question the gods. So we're just supposed to give them credit for all we do? How can you say that after everything Athena has done for you? Who sits at my loom day after day? It's my hard work, my skill, my artistry. That's what makes me the best weaver in the world. Like I said, only Athena could do better. No, she could not. Arachne, how dare you speak this way? The gods do not take kindly to mortal who makes us boast. I'm not afraid. Athena, I challenge you to a weaving contest. Arachne's words hung heavy in the air as Sophia and the merchant left the workshop. Later, Callista rushed into the workshop. I heard that you challenged the goddess Athena to a weaving contest. Before Arachne could reply, Athena, disguised as an old woman, walked into the workshop. She gazed at the hanging tapestries. How beautiful! Thanks be to Athena. Arachne rolled her eyes. Now, dear, surely you're not denying Athena the recognition she is due. What do you know about it? With age comes experience. Ask Athena to pardon you. Tell her how foolish you were to deny her hand in your gifts. Lissa stared closely at the woman. Arachne, I really, really think you should listen to this woman. My gifts are my own. If Athena had the courage to answer my challenge, you would all see that for yourselves. As you wish. Her eyes flashing with anger, Athena shed her disguise and rose her full eyes. Her eyes became very still. All right, Arachne, here are the terms of our contest. If you win, you shall receive that ridiculous glory that you seek. Clearly, it is not enough for you to be the greatest among mortals, but... Know this. As Athena spoke, the room shook. If you lose, you shall never weave again. History will remember you only as a foolish and ungrateful young woman. If history remembers you at all. Let's just have two looms side by side. Plead for forgiveness and walk away from this contest. How would it look if I backed out now? It would look like you came to your senses. I'm sure I have nothing to worry about. A panel of judges took their seats as a group of onlookers chattered with excitement.
tapestries will be judged according to their originality, beauty, and craftsmanship. Athena and Arachne plunged themselves into their work. They did not look up or speak a word for hours. Athena pulled threads of silver from the clouds and threads of gold from the sun. She used all the colors of nature in her work. Arachne was not intimidated by this display. Her fingers flew back and forth over the loom at lightning speed. Finally, the weavers came to rest. Arachne's tapestry was exquisite, every bit as magnificent as Athena's. My tapestry portrays the gods and goddesses in all their glory and power. My tapestry depicts the gods and goddesses at their worst. You commit acts of cruelty, foolishness, and injustice with no concern for the lives of others, least of all mortals. About time someone showed you your true nature. Oh, Arachne, what have you done? Athena was enraged. She ripped the tapestry from Arachne's hands and stamped. Foolish, foolish girl! I hope you enjoy weaving that monstrosity, for it was the last thing you shall ever weave. You will pay the price for your arrogance and disrespect, Arachne. But I won fair and square, and your anger can never change that. The contest is over, and you have lost. Tears slid down Arachne's face. But how can I live if I can't weave? Please, great Athena, take pity on her. Athena considered Arachne for a moment and decided to take pity upon the girl. Very well, I shall show you mercy. You shall weave Arachne, you shall weave for all eternity, but you shall do it as a different creature. Athena put a horrible spell on Arachne. Soon Arachne's body shrunk and turned into a black orb, her limbs turned into eight spindly legs. Arachne ran off into a dark corner of the room and began to spin and weave a magnificent web. Arachne was and still is the best weaver of all time. Her work and skills live among her descendants, the spiders of our world, who continue to spin their webs today. And are called Arachnids in honor of Arachne. Look for Arachne weaving her beautiful webs and learn what too much pride can do. And so ends the tale of the first spider. Demeter was the goddess of agriculture, grain, and the harvest, who was worshipped by the people of Greece as they depended upon her favor for their food and survival. The ancient Greeks believed that originally the earth had only one continuous season, which produced never-ending, abundant crops. In our last myth of the evening, you will learn why the earth now has more than one season. Come meet Demeter and her daughter Persephone. Many years ago, the seasons were not as they are today. It was always spring. The sun shone and the ground yielded great harvests. Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, was eternally happy. She had a daughter named Persephone, and Demeter loved her very much. Persephone was very beautiful and was in charge for caring for the earth's flowers. Down in the underworld, Hades, the god of that dark place, was very unhappy. He decided to pay a visit to his brother Zeus. Greetings, my brother. Greetings, Hades. To what do I owe this visit? It is so dark and dull and dreary in the underworld. I fear it is making me depressed. What could I do to help, brother? The only things that might brighten things up a bit would be a beautiful queen. Yes, Hades. But what woman would want to marry you and live in the underworld? I realize that. Do you have anyone in mind? Yes, I do. Lovely Persephone. Demeter's beloved daughter? Her mother would never allow such a match. I know. That is why I have a plan. Hades told Zeus his plan to steal Persephone. And Zeus, being a loyal brother, did nothing to stand in Hades' way. Back on Earth, Persephone was wandering through a field, decorating the flowers that grew there. Oh, I've never noticed a strange flower in the meadow before. Its petals are so red like drops of blood. I must have it. Little did Persephone know that Hades, the god of the underworld, had placed the unusual flower there as a trap. Persephone leaned over to pluck the scarlet flower. Up came the plant, and with it, long roots came dragging out of the ground, leaving a wide hole behind. Immediately, a fierce rumbling began, and the gaping hole began spreading and opening like a huge mouth. Out of the hole leaped a tall figure in a flowing black cape. On his head was a black crown. Ha, 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 ha! Now you are mine! Persephone was snatched away before Hades had a chance to scream. Hades plunged back into the hole with Persephone, and the ground closed as quickly as it had opened. The Demeter was frantic when her daughter didn't come home, and rushed out to search for her. All night long, Demeter searched for her beloved daughter. Only silence answered her. As dawn broke across the sky, Demeter decided to ask Helios, the sun god, if he knew what had happened to Persephone. Helios, have you seen my daughter? Yes, I have seen Persephone, but you will not like what I have to say. You must tell me everything you know. Persephone was painting flowers in the meadow. Yes, go on. 
Well, there have been rumors that Hades has taken a liking to your daughter. What does Hades have to do with this? I heard that Hades was planning to make her his queen. I still don't understand why you're telling me this. Dear Demeter, I saw Persephone pick a strange red flower that was growing in the field. As soon as she plucked it, a hole opened in the ground, and Hades emerged from it. Oh, no! He grabbed Persephone and took her back with him to the underworld. This cannot be true. I'm sorry, Demeter, but I saw it with my very own eyes. What shall I do? Go to Zeus and tell him your complaint. He's the only one strong enough to force Hades into giving your daughter back. Thank you, Helios, I will. Demeter made her way to Mount Olympus and charged into the throne room where Zeus sat. Zeus, Zeus, Persephone has been captured by Hades. He has taken her down to the underworld. Calm yourself, Demeter. This may be a nice arrangement for both Hades and Persephone. Never. Persephone is a spring child. She needs sunshine or she will waste away and die. As Demeter was speaking to Zeus, she noticed a new thunderbolt hanging on the wall behind him. Only Hades had the skill to design such a gift. Demeter realized that the gift must have been offered in exchange for Persephone. She felt betrayed and defeated. You knew that Hades took my Persephone. How could you have allowed such a thing? I admit I did nothing to stop him. Hades is my brother, after all. You will regret this, Zeus. Weeks passed. Loud groans echoed from Earth and filled the halls of Olympus. Zeus called for his messenger, Hermes. Hermes, my son, attend me. Yes, Zeus. How may I serve you? You always travel between Olympus and Earth. What's going on down there? Nothing is growing. The blazing sun has dried everything up. There's no green anywhere. This is distressing indeed. People and animals are starving. Something must be done. Blazing sun, you say? Helios? Yes, your majesty? You are burning all the crops on Earth. The mortals and animals are starving. I, too, have observed the suffering on Earth, but I assure you, it is none of my doing. Who could re be responsible for such misery? Who has the power to affect the growth of everything green on Earth? Demeter! She is terribly upset over the loss of her daughter. I'm afraid there will be more suffering unless you do something, and quickly. Zeus immediately sent for Demeter. Are you the one responsible for the famine on Earth? Yes. Until Persephone is returned to me, I will see to it that nothing grows on Earth. Every animal and mortal will starve. Very well. I see that your daughter must be restored to you. Oh, thank you, Zeus. However, if she is in any food wall with Hades, she must remain with him. No food will have passed her lips. I'm sure she has been too sad to eat a morsel. Then I will send Hermes to the underworld to demand Persephone's release. Hermes? Yes, Zeus? You must go to you must go to Hades at once with this message and demand the release of Persephone. My wing shoes get me there quicker. I'm off, Zeus. In the meantime, down in the underworld, Persephone had been spending her days with the Dark King. Persephone, your beauty has caused a gentleness to come upon me. You are worth more than these rubies and diamonds that I adorn you with. I will not take your gifts. I will never forgive you for what you have done to me. I have had dresses spun of gold and silver made especially for you. I want to go home to my mother. Your throne, my lady, is made of the finest ebony, and I have given you a crown of black pearls. I despise you. And I always will. Even though Persephone continued throwing tantrums, she was secretly and slowly beginning to enjoy the attention Hades gave her. Although she longed for sunshine and flowers, she secretly admired Hades and the power he possessed. But Persephone still insisted on pouting and refusing to allow a crumb of food to pass her lips. Please eat, Persephone. I've had my cook prepare you the most delicious meals. Never! I will not eat until I return to my mother. In an effort to please Persephone, Hades gave her some ground in which she could plant a garden. He gave her rare seeds to plant that did not need sunlight. Before long, a small strange tree filled with dark crimson fruit appeared. One afternoon, as Persephone was gardening, she was especially hungry. It had been such a long time since she had eaten. I'm so hungry! What could it hurt to just eat a little? Persephone plucked a piece of fruit and cut it in half. The fruit was filled with juicy red seeds. I'll only eat a few of these seeds. Mmm, I've never tasted anything so delicious. One, two, three, four, five. Just as Persephone swallowed a six pomegranate seed, a cry that could only be Hermes split the air. Good day, Persephone. Good day, Hermes. I bring you a message from your mother. She wants you home. I'm sure you haven't eaten anything during your stay here. Let's go. Uh, Before Persephone could say a word, Hermes brought her back to her mother. One of his phantoms rushed to Hades, telling him of Persephone's escape. And also revealing that Persephone had eaten six pomegranate seeds. By the time Persephone was home, Hades had already been to visit Zeus. Persephone has eaten six pomegranate seeds in my kingdom. She must return to me. This is the law, Zeus. You are correct, my brother. Hermes? Yes, Your Majesty? Fetch Demeter and Persephone. Once the women reached Olympus, Zeus explained the situation. Because Persephone ate six seeds of the pomegranate, she returned to Hades for six months out of every year. 
The remaining six months will be spent on Earth. My heart will break without my Persephone. Don't cry, Mother. We must be happy for the time that I'm here with you. I will be happy while you are here. In appreciation for your mercy, Zeus, I will even help those mortals you are so fond of. I will show them how to harvest food and save it for the months when my daughter is in the underworld. Then I will provide a bountiful growing season when my beloved Persephone is returned to me. Very well, it is settled. And so it remains, year after year, as the seasons change from one to another. The law is fulfilled and Persephone returns to Hades six months of every year. And that is why there are seasons on Earth. I just want to thank you so much for coming tonight. I love each and every one of your children. I want to thank you very, very, very much for letting me work with them. They're absolutely fantastic. A lot of these kids I've had since third grade, so I'm very sad it's our last, our last time together. So thank you for everything. And I also want to say a special thank you. We had some stomach virus situations today. So we had a lot of kids filling in last minute and they did a wonderful, wonderful job. So thank you, thank you, Mrs. Freeland. Thank you, Ms. Masio in the back. Thank you very much.